Let us pray. Gracious God, during these moments, make clear your vision that we may realize that we can see you in all we meet, all we do, all we are, all we can become. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. He is the CEO of an international Christian relief organization. According to a website, his annual salary is 800,000 and his net worth is 10 million. Periodically, I see him in television advertisements encouraging views, viewers to what he calls get saved. How does a person get saved? According to him, all that a person needs to do is pray the so-called sinner's prayer which goes something like this. Jesus, I am a sinner. I need you. I believe that you died on the cross and shed your blood for me. Come into my heart. I accept you as my personal Lord and Savior. And then he says, if you prayed that prayer, then you're now Christian. This approach to the faith primarily focuses on becoming a Christian and making it to heaven. Quite frankly, I don't see anywhere in the Bible where Jesus or anyone else speaks of a sinner's prayer as the route to becoming a Christian. And the primary focus of Scripture is on this life and how to live faithfully each day. And the focus is on this life and not a point in time when we become a Christian, but on the continuing unfolding of being a follower each day. I like what Maya Angelou once said in reply to someone who asked her this question, are you a Christian? Maya Angelou responded with, already? But it's easy for us in progressive Christian traditions to be bang away on people like that TV minister. It's like shooting fish in a barrel. It might even be fun to do this. I'm kind of enjoying it right now, in fact. It can be fun in part because it keeps us from looking closely at ourselves. But if we listen to Jesus' words from Luke today, Jesus calls us to look at ourselves. But just what does it mean to be a Christian? I actually prefer the language of what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus because as I indicated, the primary focus of the Bible isn't on a point in time when we become a Christian. The focus is on following Jesus in discipleship. Our passage today doesn't give an exhaustive list about what it means to be a follower of Jesus, but it does tell us in part what it means. If it is easy to pray a sinner's prayer, our reading today makes it clear that being a follower of Jesus is not easy. Jesus uses some strong language in today's reading. Whoever comes to me and does not hate, hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and even life itself cannot be my disciple. Does it really take hating family and life itself to be a follower of Jesus? If this is the case, I don't think I can be a follower. These words of Jesus seem so harsh, and they seem to contradict his words of loving all people that we read in other places and his desire for followers of Jesus to enjoy the journey that we hear in other places. In researching for today's sermon, I found out that to hate is a Semitic expression meaning to turn away from or to detach oneself from. There is nothing in that emotion we experience in the expression, I hate you. Still, our words for meditation that we heard point out that what is demanded of disciples is that in the network of many loyalties, in which all of us live, the claim of Jesus in the gospel not only takes precedence, but in fact, redefines the others. 
This can and necessarily will involve detaching some, turning away from. In our reading today and in other readings from other places in Luke and the other Gospels, they talk about the call of letting go of loyalties. Do you agree that the call of the gospel takes precedence over all other loyalties? This does not downplay the importance of other loyalties, such things as family, friends, work, school, and church. But Jesus seems to be saying that to be a follower, the gospel is the lens through which we look at and look at through and evaluate all other commitments. Because it is not easy to follow Jesus, Luke tells us that Jesus says that we are to count the cost before we choose to follow him. And Jesus uses two parables to make his point. We usually don't or met, never do say to someone who is considering joining the church, now go home, think about whether you want to do this because following Jesus is not easy. Go home, reflect on it, pray about it, read scripture to see what Jesus says and demands, then decide if you really want to be part of the church. We would not dare do that because most churches are in a panic mode these days. Attendance has dropped over the decades in many churches. There is high anxiety among many followers of Jesus in the church. So we probably don't want to say what Jesus says. Count the cost. Then decide if you want to follow through with your commitment. We want more people. We don't want to turn anyone away from the church. This is not to say that the church is an exclusive club that doesn't realize that we all fall short, that the church doesn't realize that we all make mistakes, that the church doesn't realize to use traditional language of the Bible that we all sin. We don't have to have all of our ducks in a row to be part of the church. But once again, following Jesus is not easy. Jesus drives us home with his words, whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. In some ways, it is more difficult to follow Jesus than not following him because we are called to do things that sometimes are contrary to our nature, loving those whom we might find very difficult, praying for those who we don't particularly like, reaching out when we don't feel like reaching out and working for justice. An example of the difficulty of following Jesus is in the last sentence of today's reading. None of you can become my disciple if you do not give up all your possessions. There are some people who have taken these words to heart and have given up everything to be a follower. But as he often did, Jesus is probably using hyperbole to jar his hearers. Also, by the time that the Gospel of Luke was composed, it was believed that Jesus was going to come back at any time. And if tomorrow Jesus is coming back, we probably aren't too concerned about our possessions. But it obviously did not happen. And you may disagree with me, but I believe it's not going to happen. What I do believe is that God's reign comes more fully through us when we promote love, peace, and justice. And when we do that, Jesus has come again. A primary focus of the Gospels is on how we are to live with the kind of openness to God that Jesus did, rather than worrying about Jesus' return. Focusing on the present and how to live for God now is the way that Jesus lived, so it seems that ought to be the way we live. Then what we, do we do with these words about giving up all of our possessions? As I have pointed out before, Luke, more than any of the Gospels, talks about our relationship to money, to possessions, our attachment to them. And he would probably say the same thing to us. 
And as it is with other loyalties, our loyalty to God is to take precedence over the loyalty to money. Luke tells us to live with an open hand rather than a closed fist when it comes to money. I like to put it this way. We are called to travel light. This is easier said than done. How do we rid ourselves of all of our stuff if we want to do so even? I currently live in a two bedroom apartment. I have two large walk-in closets, so I don't need a storage unit. I've just shoved all my extra possessions into the closets. Because my rent shot up, I decided to downsize to one bedroom. But I'm really not downsizing that much because I had to get a storage unit. It's at the apartment complex. I had to get that to store all the unnecessary items that I just can't bring myself to let go of. Who knows, I might need those sports magazines at some point. I might need those back issues of the Christian century, that progressive Christian periodical. And there is no way I'm going to part with any of the books that I have, those books I probably won't read before I die, but I've convinced myself that I will. Like a good parent, I'm going to leave it up to my daughters to decide what to do with all of those things when I pass from this life. I say all of this to confess that I'm not heeding the admonition of Jesus to travel light. Maybe someday I will bring myself to figuring out how to do it and actually do it. I wonder what Luke and Jesus would say to me. But if following Jesus is so hard, why do we choose to do so? If we look at Jesus, we get the answer. We see someone who was truly free. Our opening prayer today was this, Holy One, we await the touch of your presence with eagerness. Refresh, renew, and heal us that we might live with purpose, enthusiasm, and courage after the manner of Jesus, who was truly whole. That's what we long for, whether we realize it or not, wholeness. What is wholeness? It's hard to put into words, but we know it when we have it. And when we have it, others can see it in us. It doesn't mean that we're happy all the time, but we can be joyous most of the time when we are whole. Joy is a deep-seated feeling of freedom. Without wholeness, life is a chore, but with it, life is full of adventure. I wish wholeness for you and for me.